Ik ben Hagenaar, ik ben Nederlander en ik ben Europeaan. En daarom hijs ik op 9 mei deze Europese vlag. Op 9 mei hijs ik de vlag. Omdat Europa een belangrijke rol speelt in de internationale diplomatie en werkt aan vrede, veiligheid en welvaart in de wereld. Waarbij ze enorm veel waarde hecht aan de democratie en de rechtsstaat. Net als Den Haag. Wij hijsen de Europese vlag omdat we sterker met elkaar staan met alle Europeanen en de Oekraïners. Onbekend maakt de onbemind. Daarom hijs ik de Europese vlag op 9 mei om het gesprek in mijn omgeving aan te gaan over het belang van de Europese Unie. Ik hijs op 9 mei de Europese vlag omdat samenwerking in de Europese Unie zorgt voor meer welvaart voor Haagse inwoners. Op 9 mei hijs ik de Europese vlag want in Europa heb je kansgelijkheid. Europa is verenigd, nu de rest van de wereld nog. Om te vieren dat we op de goede weg zijn, hijs ik op 9 mei de Europese vlag. Ik hijs de Europese vlag voor een vreedzame en welvarende toekomst voor ons en onze kinderen. Handel is heel erg belangrijk voor onze economie. En daar hoort een sterke euro bij. En daarom hang ik vol trots de Europese vlag uit op 9 mei. Ik heb jaren in Azië gewoond en daar ben ik me echt een Europeaan gaan voelen. Daarom vier ik 9 mei de dag van Europa en hijs ik de vlag. We hebben in Ippenburg een prachtige mast. En we zijn trots op de EU, vandaar dat we deze vlag graag op willen hangen. We hebben in ons leven zoveel oorlog meegemaakt, nu is het tijd voor vrede. En daarom hijsen wij de Europese vlag. Ja! Oh, oh wat ben ik blij! Mooi, goedenavond uh, allemaal. Uh... Ik doe dit even in, nog in het Nederlands. Zometeen gaan we namelijk naar het Engels toe. Het heeft alles mee te maken dat er wat uh, internationale ja, uh, mensen hier in ons gezelschap uh, tussen zitten. Dus daarom is het even handig om uh, in het Engels te spreken. Dat ga ik straks doen. Uh, ik ga wat vragen stellen. Uh, jullie mogen ook vragen stellen. Dat mag dus ook in het Engels graag. Mocht dat nou wat lastig zijn, stel hem dan in het Nederlands. Vertalen wij hem aan een van de twee uh, gasten. En de, onze twee gasten, uh, Ivo en uh, DJ, die gaan hun verhaal ook in het Engels doen. Dus dat is even de reden voor... Hè, als er nou mensen zijn in de zaal die zeggen van... nou. Ik kan daar helemaal niks van het Engels volgen. Ja, dan zou ik toch bijna willen zeggen, ja, daar is de deur. Uh, dat klinkt heel onaardig, maar ja, het is nou in een uurtje tijd is het bijna niet mogelijk om nou ja, alles wat wij hier bespreken, om zowel in het Engels als in het Nederlands te doen. Dus dat is even de reden waarom we daarvoor hebben moeten kiezen helaas. Mochten jullie nou na afloop denken van nou ja, dit, dit programma, van ik zet het wel eventjes uit, kunnen we even tijdens de borrel misschien, hè, want jullie spreken gewoon alle twee Nederlands, kunnen jullie gewoon gerust alle vragen in het Nederlands uh, spreken. All right, welcome uh, uh, everyone at The Hague University of Applied Sciences. Uh, my name is uh, Ivar Lingen. Uh, I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, Den Haag FM, the local broadcaster uh, of The Hague. And this evening I will be your moderator. Uh, on the 9th of May, Europe Day in The Hague, till 8 o'clock this evening. Uh, we, we will have a lecture by Ivo van de uh, Weij, uh, Weideven, uh, historian and analyst. And afterwards, there will be plenty of opportunity to ask questions uh, to uh, Ivo, but also to uh, DJ Herbert. And he is the head of European Commission representation in the Netherlands. Uh, but first of all, uh, I would like to ask your attention for the opening statement by uh, the European, uh, the head of the European Commission representation in the Netherlands, and his name is uh, DJ Hebert. Unfortunately, uh, Robert van Aste, deputy mayor in The Hague, uh, he can't be here, so that's why we asked uh, DJ. Yes. Doet hij het? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Goedenavond, bonsoir, Guten, goedenavond, good evening, bon dia, buonasera. Um, welcome to Ivo, welcome to all of you. Um, it's a pity that the deputy mayor, Robert van Asten, is not here with us, but he has professional obligations which... Uh, Just hold your microphone uh, this way, so everyone can, he can hear you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, it's extremely nice to see you. My name is Didier Hebert. I'm the head of the permanent representation of the European Commission, one of the European institutions in 
the Netherlands. Uh, the European Commission is in fact the uh, represents the European Union in the 27 countries of the European uh, Union. So I, it's a pleasure to open this event today on this very special day. Because the 9th of May is a special day for Europe. Indeed, you hear me? Yes. Yes. Indeed, 27 years ago, uh, the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, Robert Schuman, presented his famous Schuman Plan. 27, no, 72 years ago. I'm working for the European Union since 36 years. So I followed it for half of the time. Maybe, I hope, the most interesting time. With hindsight, I think we can establish that the plan of Robert Schuman laid the foundations for the European Union as it is now, as we know it today. Economic cooperation. He pleaded for strong economic cooperation. Only five years after a brutal war, the third war between France and Germany. Imagine five years after a brutal war where millions of people died, there is some person saying, let's work together and put our industry together, for the industry for coal and steel. Economic cooperation in order to create interdependency, deepened political contacts in order to, to foster mutual understanding of each other, of each other's problems, aspirations and context. Well, this has been the recipe for 72 years of peace, something which you might think which you might have thought until a couple of months ago, a kind, a kind of outdated notion. No more wars, of course, no more wars. But we see today that this has been, uh, that this is absolutely not anymore outdated. I'm delighted to see a number of familiar faces in the room. Some of you were in Amare, uh, the city's new cultural center, on the 22nd of February this year. The city, I must pay tribute to the city, has organized 14 events in the context of, I hate that name, but still, in the context of the Conference on the Future of Europe. This Conference on the Future of Europe is a kind of uh, new invention where the European decision makers want to listen to people about how, what they expect from Europe, what they fear, what they long to, and what they would like the European countries to do to together. And this conference has given many, many ideas of where do we want to go for now? Many things are already underway, but many other things are going to be uh, projects for the future. So many topics were covered, of course. Digitalization, sustainability, gender, identity. All this thanks to the team of the City of The Hague. Many of you are here and uh, really thank you very much. At the end of the, the, of the cycle, the city of The Hague presented us, the Commission, with a range of proposals, with a range of ideas on uh, how to move forward with this European cooperation. Um, in the city of law and peace, it is only normal that we think about international cooperation. It is only normal, but we need to nurture that all the way long. Peace, the single market, the European cooperation is not something 
of yesterday. It's not something that is ever going to be finished. It's, an, it's a constant strife and therefore we need you. Why do we need you? Because indeed the question is whether we have something in common. Is there something like us and them? Who is them? Maybe <coughs> some countries, some third countries. Us and them is, by the way, a beautiful song by Pink Floyd. I would uh, <laughs> recommend you to listen to that. But in any case, uh, have a look today, if it's not too dark. Because today, with the mayor of The Hague, with Mr. Van Asten, we, uh, we raised the European flag. <coughs> with you, as well, we raised the European flag. We had to turn it around, because something you don't know but I'm happy it's here. <laughs> the stars have to be standing on the two legs. Otherwise, the European stars will fall. The European project might fall. So don't do that. If you hang a flag, and we've given with the city of The Hague, we've given 250 flags to citizens who want to hang out their flag in front of their house today and for the whole week. So. That's the mayor with the French ambassador uh, on the half favor. So um, I will stop here. I've been much too long. Uh, and I would now like to give the floor back to you. Or yes. To Ivo. Yes, and then we give the floor to uh, Ivo. Good. If there will be Good. questions uh, for uh, DJ Herbert, hold them. And afterwards, after uh, Ivo, uh, uh, you can uh, ask them. So, be patient. Think, yes, be patient. <laughs> Thank you very much. Give him applause. <laughs> so, uh, I give this one to you. Yes, thank you. Ivo, uh, take your floor. All right. Well. Thank you for your kind applause and your attendance here today on Europe Day. Thank you, DJ, for your introduction on uh, what it means to be European. What it means to be European is a bit of a question mark. Uh, it's a bit of a question that uh, was a tough question to answer for a long time. Um, of course, the European project started out as a project for peace, but we seemed to have lost that direction and took the European Union for granted for such a long time. And there has been a lot of discussion about the European identity, what it means to be European. The Conference on the Future of Europe is also uh, a bit about what it means to be European and where do we want Europe to go. So uh, today, I will uh, share some thoughts um, from the other side, a view from the other side on the European Union. I will uh, give you a small insight into the brain of Vladimir Putin and the brain of Xi Jinping, because we might not know what it means, truly means to be European, but they do. And they have a very clear image on what it means to be a European and what they want to do about it and with it. And there are also other people uh, who have a very clear view on what it means to be European and who want to join the European Union. Right now, uh, there's a war going on on the edge of Europe, as you uh, all know by now. And um, one of the things the uh, Ukrainians at the moment are fighting for is their uh, freedom and their freedom to be European. Um, they've applied for European Union membership. Uh, they filled in a questionnaire. This is the handing over by Commission President von der Leyen of the questionnaire to uh, President Zelensky. They've already answered it. A uh, 5,000 page document has been returned to the Commission. And um, well, it's up to the Commission and the member states of the European Union to decide if and uh, or when uh, the Ukrainians are allowed to join the European Union. And um, also today we are here to uh, celebrate the 9th of May. And the 9th of May um, is not in the news for Europe Day, unfortunately. The news is dominated today by um, the, uh, the celebration of Victory Day in Russia. And that has also, um, I will touch upon that later, it's also a connection between the European 
uh, Union, the uh, Ukrainian desire to join the European Union and the view of Vladimir Putin of Europe. But let me shortly uh, introduce the, the, the three points I will touch upon today. Europe's identity cre crisis, uh, what it means to be European and the discussions that have been going on about what it means to be European in the past. The Chinese and, of course, the Russian perspective on European identity. And in the end, while looking at the European Union from the outside, what we can gain from that and what uh, perhaps Europe's hidden superpower is and how we might use that in the future. So Europe's identity crisis revisited. Well, um, constantly struggling with a never-ending identity crisis is a known condition. Yes, it's called being European. Um, Europe Europeans have been... Uh, as soon as we started cooperating uh, in uh, the 1952, the European Community on Steel and Coal, um, about what it will mean to be to work together and if there is one European identity. And when I prepared this lecture and I was uh, googling for images on European identity, one image always turns up. Uh, the flag that's here behind me or that's painted on this girl's face, uh, Europe blue f flag with yellow stars. We all now know the two um, uh, points have to point down to uh, keep uh, uh, the European Union and the European ideal stable. But also, um, if you look at European identity images, you will also see a lot of other national flags combining uh, together to form that European identity. Uh, Europe seems to be like a whole collection of different identities all lumped together and people often uh, feel more Dutch, feel more German, feel more French than they feel European. And one of the uh, um, minds behind the Schumann plan, uh, Jean Monnet, also a founding father of the, the European Union, he uh, once reminisced uh, or purposedly uh, reminisced, um, if I were to do it again from scratch, I would start with culture. He said, well, it's all nice, we have such good economic cooperation and uh, a beginning of a political cooperation, but um, if I would start the European ideal again, I would start with a cultural view and try to well, foster a European identity. And the European Union, the European Commission, is working on that as we speak. Uh, this is a campaign from a few years back. This is the EU. And um, we safeguard our cultural heritage. So um, there have been several projects in uh, integrating a European history. I have a few books in my library back home that are all on the, the, the ideal of Europe throughout history, starting off in the 1300s, in the 1400s, and only get, gaining flight, uh, getting airborne after uh, the, the terrors of the Second World War. But as you can see still, uh, we safeguard our cultural heritage, and what do we see passing by? National monuments with national flags. And Europe, um, well, a Europe built of culture is also a bit of an ancient Europe, a standstill Europe, uh, a Europe described by the Dutch author Ilja Leonard Pfeiffer in his uh, great novel Grand Hotel Europa as uh, stagnant water, uh, just a Disneyland to be visited by tourists and um, focusing too much on European culture. It's all focusing on the past. It's all focusing on things that have been and not things that will be. And Europe as a stagnant water is like a, um, uh, a playing thing for other powerful potentates. This is uh, an image from uh, a few years back. You can uh, see Obama and Merkel both not in power anymore, but Xi Jinping and Putin are, and they just throw the world, world politics above Europe's head and America's head because they are willing to uh, step into the future. And they have a very clear view of Europe and what it means to be European. And that brings me to the view from the other side. If we look at European history, if we look at European cultural heritage, um, quite often from the other side, the view was this. Europeans storming at you and trying to grab your land. 
uh, Europe's champions of colonization. This is an infographic and it shows the number of countries colonized by different European countries. So for a lot of uh, the world outside Europe, Europe has been a colonizer, has been an aggressor, has been uh, trying to grab parts of the world from Europe during its history. Now, Europe, the European Union, is a project of peace, but our history as a nation state or as a collection of nation states is a history of colonization, a history of trying to conquer a great deal of the world. It's not something we Europeans often think back as we look at our history, but other people like this man, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping, do. He um, is promising his people, the Chinese people, a national rejuvenation. Um, the China will gain its place, rightful place, in Xi Jinping's view, as a superpower in the world again. It had that place for 5,000 years. Then the Europeans came along and started a century of humiliation, as it has been called in, uh, in Chinese uh, history books. And they conquered, they subjugated the Chinese, and only after the Communist Revolution, after the Chinese Civil War, uh, China started in 1949, um, a year before Robert Schumann presented his plan, a way back to the top, a slow way back to the top. And now uh, Xi Jinping says it's the moment to regain our position, the position we lost to the Europeans during the 19th century. And Chinese propaganda is often focused on that image and um, I have a few short clips uh, brought with me today and let me show you a clip about Xi Jinping's vision on history narr narrated by the great man himself. My home, 世界充满着不确定性，人们对未来既寄予期待，又感到困惑。世界怎么了？我们怎么办？这是整个世界都在思考的问题，也是我一直在思考的问题。Yes, uh, well, you saw a Chinese view on history. Uh, Xi Jinping claims the European ideal of peaceful cooperation. He says, we've been doing that for like millennia. And then the Europeans came along, they brought war, crisis, a wealth gap. gap. And um, the implication in this uh, propaganda video is also, and now they're not on top of the world anymore. They're on their way down. And now is the time for China to take the opportunity and position itself as uh, a guiding light for the world. And China is really, as they say in Dutch, timmert aan de weg, is really making progress on that, uh, quite literally. Uh, this is the, the, the new Silk Road, or the Belt and Road Initiative, as it is uh, being called. It's uh, overland routes, trade routes, spreading the wealth in Chinese eyes, over the world, spreading the wealth in Central Asia, in uh, Asia proper, in Africa, and all for 
the good of the world. While Europe, if you look at Europe's history, has only been uh, doing bad things for the world. This is a, um, an infographic by the China Global Times, a uh, national newspaper under government control from a couple of years back in 2020, and um, well, they really make some bold statements here. Um, European misdeeds on human rights are racism, uh, migrant rights are not being uh, uh, upheld, gender inequality, freedom of speech is been being limited in Europe. And um, well, this is the original version, which also includes the Holocaust in a, the recent version, the one you can find now on the Global Times website, they've decided to scratch that. But the message is clear, Europe has not been doing so well in Chinese uh, eyes uh, for the world and has brought a lot of destruction and mayhem. And if you look at uh, uh, some, a ruler a little bit closer to home, uh, the man you have been seeing uh, quite a lot on television uh, lately, uh, Vladimir Putin, he would heartily agree with Xi Jinping. He also paints an image of Russia being under attack, the world being under attack by the West, by NATO, by the Americans and their allies, the European Union, all through history, all through Russian history, all through world history. And even today, uh, the 9th of May, the Victory Day parade in Moscow, he was uh, using that as an argument why he had to invade Ukraine. He was telling people, well, um, we've won World War II, we've defeated um, the evil from the West back then, and now they're back at our doorstep. NATO is back at our doorstep. The European Union is back at our doorstep. They're trying to attack our Russian traditional values, uh, something Xi Jinping uh, would also say. And we are, well, we have to just fight back. We cannot allow them to occupy us again as they have been doing in the past. And also, this is a message that is uh, uh, quite aptly put into uh, propaganda by uh, the Russian government. Although the film, I will show you next, a little clip, um, is supposedly made by an independent graphic designer, um, by which I must add that um, this graphic designer is also a very... Um, apt uh, a polyglot because the video appeared on YouTube with 27 language transla translations. So um, either way, he's brilliant uh, and or perhaps some uh, Kremlin influence is there. But let's just uh, uh, roll the clip. Да, я оккупант. И я устал извиняться за это. Я оккупант по праву рождения. Я агрессор и кровожадный урод. Бойтесь. Это я терпел зверство польских интервентов во времена смуты. Но чем закончилась их интервенция? Это я жук Москву, чтобы не отдать ее Наполеону. Но как закончил Наполеон? Это я сидел в окопе у Волоколамска, понимая, что нацистов удержать не получится. Где теперь те нацисты? Где их проклятый Гитлер? Ко мне домой приходили все, кому не лень. Турки, англичане, поляки, немцы, французы. Земли хватило на всех. По два с половиной метра на каждого. Поймите, мне не нужна ваша лицемерная свобода. Мне не нужна ваша гнилая демократия. Мне чуждо все, что вы называете западными ценностями. У меня другие интересы. Вежливо предупреждаю в последний раз. Не нарывайтесь. Я строю мир. Я люблю мир. Но воевать я умею лучше всех. С уважением, русский оккупант. Yes, and this video, uh, which has uh, Barack Obama again as a recipient, shows that this message is not something that Vladimir Putin is doing right now. He has been doing it for quite some time. This frame, this historical frame, this image of the West as an enemy, of, of of the West being alien to Russian traditional values has been propagated uh, for a long time. It is intensified the messaging uh, after the annexation of Crimea in 2014, but even before that, uh, the Russian victory in the Second World War against uh, fascism was put up as an example and as um, a mirror image of NATO encroaching upon Russia's borders. So uh, this is an image from the, uh, the Dutch-Russian uh, friendship year in 2013 uh, when we were protesting against uh, uh, then new uh, anti-gay laws in uh, Russia. But 
these kind of demonstrations, they play into uh, the frame that Putin is uh, putting up for uh, domestic consumption. And um, it's also, uh, he really rails against it and says, well, this is a de de degeneration of European uh, f uh, traditional values. Europe started out as a Christian society. They have lost their way. And the uh, insidious, perfidious thing is uh, people in Europe are susceptible to this message. There are certain right-wing politicians in uh, Europe, in the European Union, who are also claiming that indeed Europe is going the wrong way. And this is a, a book from uh, way back when, uh, The uh, Untergang des Abendlandes by Oswald Spenger, written after the, the First World War. But in some circles, it is gaining popularity as Europe, uh, the Abendland, the West, uh, is... Uh, on its way down, and we should return to traditional values. We should return to uh, all the old Europe and, um, well, shake that uh, European ideal and get back to the nation state. But I would argue, um, as DJ did in his introduction, Europe has brought a lot of good things to Europe. Or the European Union, the European Corporation. This is uh, 10 years ago, I realized today. Um, 2012, the European Union getting a Nobel Peace Prize for the wealth and prosperity and the stability it has brought to the continent. And um, we were talking about the stars being uh, uh, presented as uh, the two uh, points down to keep them stable. And it's an image that uh, is also, um, or was also uh, used by uh, Dutch European Commissioner uh, Timmermans, when he uh, was in his uh, previous commission, uh, he was uh, in charge of uh, human rights, and he made a, a very apt message on what it means uh, for Europe and why Europe is so good for uh, uh, wealth, uh, prosperity and stability. Our union is based on the tripod of democracy, human rights and the rule of law. And through the European history, we know that if we abandon one of the legs of the tripod, the whole tripod will topple. Never can one be used against the other if we do not want to revisit the horrible mistakes Europeans have made in our past. Europe is ultimately an idea and a promise that it is possible to overcome age-old antagonisms, that it is possible to live together, trade together, work together in freedom and peace. Freedom. Freedom is what so many people fought for. The European Union, based on the rule of law, democracy, and respect for human rights, is the concrete expression of the will of freedom of 500 million Europeans. So, human rights, that is what we are. Uh, um, equality for all, working together, living together, um, uh, prosper together, that is the ascension, essential uh, aspect of the European Union, of the European project, according to, to Timmermans. And actually, that is also the rule of law. The rule of law is also Europe's hidden superpower. This is a book from uh, also a few years back, The Brussels Effect, How the European Union Rules the World. Unbeknownst to uh, many Europeans, um, all the boring bits of the European Union are actually the most powerful bits of the European Union. The rules and regulations, uh, the bureaucracy of the European Union, that is uh, Europe's hidden superpower. Yes, European uh, cooperation is often a compromise, uh, slow uh, politics, political process, uh, lots of debates in damp, dark rooms, but the compromises and the rules and regulations that flow forth from those uh, uh, dark uh, meeting rooms, um, they actually are Europe's hidden superpower. Europe has the strictest regulation on the planet, I would argue, and for a lot of uh, manufacturers and big companies like Apple, Facebook, uh, or um, uh, even McDonald's, considering food safety, it's uh, the best to keep stick to the European rules and regulations, but that, because that will mean that you will, uh, in one go, have all the regulations all over the world. So Europe can set the agenda. Europe is a powerful um, block 
in the world, but we must be able to um, defend this Brussels effect. And uh, like DJ said, for so many years, it was like, oh, this is just so boring. Uh, boring politicians in gray suits meeting to um, decide on the fate of European unions. But it has meant peace, and that is back in European view. And um, today, the summary for the Conference of the Future of Europe was presented by uh, or to um, Madame von der Leyen and um, President Macron of France. And actually, uh, one of the most important things next to health uh, that European citizens identified as something Euro Europe should do with was security. So having an enemy on the border, having uh, an un someone on the other side, like Putin and Xi Jinping portray Europe, also is in a cruel uh, leap of faith happening to Europe right now. Knowing, um, looking at Ukraine makes us know what we are and makes us know where we want to go. We do not want to go the way of Russia. We do not want to go the way of China. We want to go the way of Europe. And for that to happen, we have to be able and we have to be prepared to fight for Europe. Right now, uh, the Ukrainians are doing the fighting for us. We are supporting them and we have been supporting them on a European level with sanctions, with uh, supplies of weapons. But you also see uh, this weekend the first cracks in European Union starting European unity starting to appear, uh, the Hungarians not really wanting to cut off Russian oil and all such of things. So we should be prepared to go for a longer future, to be prepared to go the, um, the, yeah, the extra mile and um, continue to be an example for the world, continue to um, fight for our ideals, as uh, uh, Commissioner Timmermans said in his uh, promo video. And I think in the future, uh, Europe might be, and European identity might be indeed the rule of law and the shining example Europe can set for the rest of the world. But we have to be prepared to fight for it as Ukraine and the situation and the war going in Ukraine is um, unfortunately showing us every day in the news. So. So far, my introduction for the Dutch audience, uh, the Dutch speaking audience that is, n well, couldn't follow my story in, uh, in English. Uh, um, you can uh, um, refer to your library for uh, my books or to evovdw.nl and uh, uh, see my recent articles and work. But uh, you can also grab the, uh, uh, the opportunity to ask English questions or Dutch questions will be translated right now. And I thank you for your attention and I hope for a, I hope for a nice Q&A. Thank you. Ivo van der Weideven. I would like to invite you both, uh, DJ and uh, Ivo, uh, to sit here. Are there any questions uh, for yeah, DJ or Ivo? Yes. Here we are. I'm holding it. So okay. <laughs> Thank you. I actually have three questions, but uh, all of them are, are are connected. So the first one is about war. Uh, I think I asked Ivo that question before. Uh, like, do we have to go every time to war to say that we are united, to be united as a continent and as a people? And uh, the second question is about uh, China conquering and uh, somehow colonizing the rest of the world by using the say or the, ther the term that I did not colonize you. I was, a col I was colonized like you as well. So here I'm uh, I, with open arms to try to help. How as a European can we tackle that message knowing that we have a history of colonization? And the last question is about uh, liberal values. How do we act about it knowing that it is not believable anymore outside of our borders? Those are my three questions. Mm. Or, all right, yes, uh, just the first answer. All right, yes. Um, for the first question, uh, does Europe need a war to know uh, where it must go and to unite? Um, 
it has been said um, that Europeans or the European Union thrives best in times of crisis. Um, the biggest uh, steps forward in European cooperation were made in time of crisis. The financial crisis of 2008, uh, the corona crisis uh, just behind us, and now uh, the war in Ukraine is also uh, well making uh, Europeans think twice about their security and huge historical decisions being made in Germany and other member states in uh, improving the sec security of the Europeans. So, um, unfortunately, uh, history of European cooperation up until now uh, has shown that the biggest leaps uh, are made in a time of crisis, indeed. But, like they say, never waste a good crisis. And uh, luckily, the European Union uh, hasn't wasted uh, those crises that have been uh, behind us. So, But maybe DJ would like to add upon that. He's on. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you're right that if you if we look at the last years, um, I mean, these crises have pushed European leaders to ask themselves where did they want to go. The good thing is that they always came out with a solution. They always came out with a willingness not to go down, uh, be it for the financial crisis, be it for the migration crisis, be it for Brexit, be it for the, for the, pan, uh, for the pandemic. What is interesting as well is that we saw that the answers came more and more rapidly. I mean, for the financial, during the financial crisis, for two years, uh, there, were, there were summits and the leaders wanted to, 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 to come out with something. It took two years. But if you compare with the recent pandemic, well, it started on my birthday on the 13th of March, but then in, um, on the 25th of July, you had a huge recovery uh, program agreed in three months for there has never been so much uh, as a plan for recovery. Fifteen years later, they agreed, the leaders, to ask for European vaccines available to everyone in Europe. In three months, these vaccines were then produced in Europe. In three months, they could agree on the famous uh, Corona Pass, so that one could, uh, one could prove that one was either uh, cured or vaccinated. It was sometimes not enough, because of course, it's, it's, I mean, member states remain uh, responsible for that. But the, 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 out, the other thing is then, can Europe act without a crisis? <laughs> is Europe only reactive, preaching or muddling further in peacetime, and only getting its act together, which is already something, in crisis time? Well, maybe not, if you look, if you look uh, a little bit further away. I mean, in the 90s, everybody was excited about this big project, the European single market. Was there a crisis? I'm not sure. In the years, in the beginning of 2000, everybody was excited about the euro. Some people were telling that it had no future. Was there a crisis? No. So my question comes, uh, my question is then, what brings us to have this either common purpose, I would not say common identity, what is it? Is it crisis? Is it, and there I stop, but because it's, it would be interesting to have your view, <laughs> is it the project itself that brings us towards a, a kind of common identity, the single market? Well, European single or is it our successes? 
if we have success, then we are thriving on these successes and we say, okay, let's continue with that because it is a success. But I stop here. Sh shall we uh, listen to his reaction, <laughs> his view? Yeah, well, that's quite interesting because I'm happy that you show as well that it's not only in time of crisis that Europe has acted. So that uh, perspective, I didn't quite see it before. Um, but then um, that's then the part that I'm wondering about liberal democracies and values, the fact that they are undermined and questioned right now. And uh, those who are questioning it are using a legitimate reason. Like, what is then our response to that? Because it feels right now as if liberal values are only believable within the Western borders, within Europe and uh, America, if I can put it that way. But outside of those borders, it is now questionable. So what is then our response to that? Who you are asking to? Ivo or DJ? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we only have uh, 10 minutes left, so uh, maybe okay. keep it short. Yeah, I'll keep it short. Yeah, no, um, um, But you, your other second question beforehand was, uh, China is making inroads around the world and uh, establishing power. Um, but you can also uh, see that um, countries in Africa, countries in Asia are uh, willing to take China's money, but are not willing to take China's way of life. They don't want to import the Chinese uh, model, the Chinese state, model, they want to have an American model. They want to be a democracy, if only sometimes in, in just in uh, on paper, but um, uh, Europe and the European ideal, the ideal of democracy, the, the ideal of rule of law, the trias politica and all those things that are uh, uh, well originated in Europe are still um, the lodestone of uh, countries and where they want to go. So even though China is making inroads in the world and uh, liberal values are not um, as, um, um, well, logical as they used to be or logical as they are in European eyes, they are still uh, a, a way to the future for a lot of countries and a lot of people in the world. All right, any other questions? Just raise your hand. I saw your hand uh, before. Yes. I myself come from Lithuania, therefore the security, the European security dilemma is very vivid in family at home everywhere. And my question is, is the strategy of common security independently from NATO is possible within the European Union? Good question. Maybe DJ? Can you finish your question? Because I, I didn't understand the last words. Is about, the strategy about the strategy of European Union safety independently from NATO? No, it is not. I mean, uh, and maybe the problem is that the European project has always has always been built on the no more war, peace, civilian things. So everything which had to do with security was. I mean, in my daily life, I saw that when we talked about defense research, defense-related research, when we talked about trade in dual use, when we talked about uh, development help to some villages in Africa to defend themselves against uh, uh, roading bands and so on, it was always, no, this is not civilian only. Today maybe Europe has to use and be less shy to use the word autonomy, power. But for this, it has to create its own brand. What is it? Our identity? No. You are different from Greek people. We are different. Even the Flemish and the Dutch are different. <laughs> but we do things in our own way. I was in the United States and I saw a little church between two big skyscrapers. And a friend of mine told me, you would never build that in Europe. We do it our own way. Diverse, tolerant, volunteer, and maybe with this soft power like uh, setting rules and mm -hmm. values. But no, it yeah. has to do... It has to do Hold with... Hold your microphone. Uh... It has, yes. <laughs> we have to work with NATO. All right. We, yes. Uh, any other questions I saw here? Yeah? Yes. 
Thank you very much. Thank you both, Ivo and Didier, for your um, talk uh, earlier. Uh, Ivo, you mentioned we're seeing fragments of the unity within the EU in relation to the war in Ukraine, but um, we've seen this actually already over the past several years with Hungary and Poland, and um, there have been attempts by the European Union to address the backsliding in the rule of law and the change in those sort of seemingly um, respect for liberal values, the shared European values. But I'm wondering how much do you think that the, the war in Ukraine is actually going to serve to put a stop towards the EU's collective response to this backsliding, this moving away from the European values that we're witnessing in Hungary and Poland? Yes, well, unfortunately, the uh, war in Ukraine will have a negative effect on European efforts to stop the backsliding, I fear. Um, it is now, we see, for example, Poland uh, uh, accepting a lot of Ukrainian refugees and uh, them telling, well, yeah, but we do need the money to uh, keep all those uh, refugees safe here in Poland. And of course, we could send them on to the rest of Europe. So you see uh, a tendency of, well, okay, we were holding back on funds from the recovery, uh, Corona Recovery Fund. And now it's like the discussion is going, well, maybe we should just give them the money and uh, um, let them use it to uh, help those refugees. They need, they need the money for, for uh, our safety, uh, so to say. Um, so you see a negative effect on the, uh, on the, the, the backsliding or the, the, the countering the backsliding on the liberal values. But I think um, as a, a European brand, it's very important to uh, keep tabs on that backsliding. This maybe um, uh, if uh, the situation in Ukraine, um, well, gets better, and I sincerely hope the war will end and Europe, uh, Ukraine will return to peace and Europe will return uh, to a situation of peace again, uh, then one of the important things is indeed uh, keeping your own members in line, keeping your own members, uh, um, well, uh, making them respect the values you set together. So uh, that's a very important thing, and unfortunately now it's not going really in the right direction. All right, we only have time for three more questions. Yes? Uh, I was just wondering, like, for example, Russia or China, how are they supposed to take EU values seriously if they're not even fully implemented in the policies that the EU kind of puts out or even broken by its own policies? You asking this to DJ or <laughs> both? <laughs> Keep it short. Well, one of the advantages or one of the strengths of the Union is that it has an enormous power of attraction on the European continent. All the member states who have joined the Union have asked and wanted to do that. And that is maybe what irritates our friend <laughs> Mr. Putin, that never has there been any country forced to join the Union or to remain in the Union. So maybe that's one element, indeed. But it is not a state. And you're right, Europe is not a state. So is it a super state? It is not a state. Ivo? Yes, well, in, um, like DJ said, there is an enormous attraction and um, that superpower, um, Russia will feel uh, the pain of a market of 500 million consumers falling away and not consuming uh, Russian products anymore. China or Chinese uh, uh, factories will produce according to European rules and regulations to have access to a market of 500 million uh, uh, customers. So uh, like Bill Clinton once said, it's the economy, stupid. It's really boring and but it's it's the power of uh, of europe and it's the attraction of europe and it's the way uh, europe can uh, yeah influence the rest of the world maybe just wanting to to to, to add to what ivo said o only I if you, ha you held your microphone like this <laughs> <laughs> i will speak very loud yes <laughs> but not for the one recording one day one day i was in the united states and some texan guy with a hat and big boots asked me why are you so, why Europeans are you so imperialistic? I was a bit uh, admonished. <laughs> and he said, look, in ISO, the International Standards Organization, we have one voice. In ILO, the labor organization, we have one vote. You have 27 in both organizations. You impose your standards 
environment, social, labor, economic, on us. If you believe on va in values, well, try to preach them, and therefore, let's have a European brand, even if yeah. the others do not like it. All right, last two questions. Maybe over there in that corner? No one? Yeah. Oh, is it a? Yeah. All right. I have a question for Ivo van der Weideveen as an historian and analyst. Um, I have a question about uh, the European identity. Uh, within the European Union, we, ha we saw that we have different uh, values and norms if it comes to the eastern part of Europe compared to the western part or the southern part. So my question is, uh, what, what do you think as an historian and analyst uh, what the biggest challenge is for European Union when it comes to uh, European identity within the European Union? Well, it's um, the things you describe. We uh, um, have different backgrounds within the European Union. Uh, we come from uh, different histories. We have a different past and we want to uh, go into the future together. So it's very important to know each other's past, uh, to know the past of the people we work together with and also the past of the people we uh, um, uh, are enemies with or we have not so good relations right now with because uh, only by knowing the past we can uh, know where to go in the future and we will know what uh, they will uh, yeah, we can understand um, their hesitation for certain uh, uh, things of European cooperation. So, um, as a historian, I would say know each other's past because that would make it easier to find a common way in the future. All right, just uh, one last question over here. I thought you want, yeah? Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, now this is the last question, therefore. I'm sorry. All right, well, you've overwhelmed me a little bit. No, it's fine. Hi. Uh, I have a question for DJ. So in the last few years, China has been really clever in hauling in a bunch of foreign scientists. Now, of course, the short-term effects of this are negligible, but they're really clever in uh, pulling in researchers from uh, Europe, from America, to their country to do research there. And this is not always uh, public research, as in it's not always commercially available to the rest of the world. In long-term situations, this will be very problematic. What can the European Union do against this? And what is the European Union doing against this? Yes, he's doing it. Yes. If you hold it like this, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Attracting talents is essential. Last week, the European Commission came back with a proposal it wanted to submit in 2014, before the migration crisis, the kind of blue card for attracting people we need, choosing people rather than tolerating everybody who wants to come here. Now, this is not an easy thing, but of course this is maybe the solution to, uh, to, to what you said. I mean, again, know what you want to do and do it, implement it. And All right. Last word for Ivo? No, I have nothing to add to this. So. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I thank you both, gentlemen, uh, Ivo van der Weideven and DJ Heber. Yeah, thank you. And I would like to thank you all for your attendance here and just uh, let's uh, grab a beer or something else over there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah.